And then I will turn this over to Tom Wenzel. He is our Outagamie County um, Master Gardeners representative who does incredible work with this lineup and he can um, um, introduce our speaker today. Okay, uh, thank you, Melanie. And uh, like Melanie said, this is the last program of the series for this year. And uh, we're starting to put together a lineup for next year. And uh, so if you have any uh, suggestions or if you have any gardening questions, you can send them to gardenersos at outagamey.org. And uh, then we'll be able to uh, uh, help you out with your questions or we need help in determining topics. Would like to thank everyone for showing up on this uh, solemn day. Um, hopefully that uh, we can all come together. Uh, Leo Roth is a research specialist of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, invasive species. And I think uh, Leo will be emphasizing that once you can identify some of these species, you will be amazed at how pervasive they are. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Leo. All right. Thanks, Tom, for the intro. And thanks, Melanie, for having me. So just give me a moment. I'm going to try and share my little presentation that I've got for you all today. So just a moment. Click all the right buttons if I'm lucky. And just confirm. Tom, Melanie, can you see the slide deck? Yes. Yep. Looks okay, good. thanks much. So as Tom mentioned, my name is Leo Roth. I'm a research specialist in the Wren's Weed Science Lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And my lab particularly studies invasive plant species in Wisconsin and their impacts on society and on the environment as well as the cost-effective management of those invasive plants. And so today I'm actually standing in for my colleague, Ann Pierce, who is the coordinator of a citizen science network called the Wisconsin First Detector Network, whose logo is in the upper right corner of this screen, which empowers Wisconsin citizens to take action regarding invasive plant species in the state through educational and volunteer opportunities like this very one. So thanks for attending. And today the topic is just invasive plants in Outagamie County and in Wisconsin more broadly. So their impacts, their identification, distribution, and what you can do about them if you so choose. So let's dive in. This talk will take about 25 to 30 minutes. So there'll be tons of time for question and answer session at the end. So fire away into your chat box and I'll get to as many as I can at the end, but there'll be plenty of time. So with that, we can jump into just a quick outline. So I'm gonna talk about what invasive plants actually are, quick definition, why you should care about them, the impacts that they have on both humans and the broader environment, where they're located throughout the state, what they look like, how you can know one when you see one, and what you can do about them. And again, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So a lot of definitions get thrown around for what an invasive plant species, what an invasive species is. And some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But frankly, I find that the one that's just in the state statute is actually a pretty excellent definition. So just to quote it, invasive plants are non-indigenous species whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. And the bolding, bolded text is mine, but I think this is a great definition because non-indigenous refers to any plant species that was not present in Wisconsin at the time of European settlement in the 1850s. And so it is a new arrival that was brought in by humans since then. So not native to Wisconsin originally. And the harm, both economic, environmental, or human health harm is the other key component to the core definition of an invasive plant species. And so um, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has what's 
colloquially called the NR40 rule or the Natural Resources Code 40 rule, which you can look up on their website. But in short, it regulates the sale, transport, or distribution of 145 plant species in Wisconsin. It's this huge list that is one of the most comprehensive in the entire United States. So it's, it's a pretty cool um, rule for its thoroughness, but that list can be pretty overwhelming. So we're going to dive into a couple key examples that I think are relevant for, for you all as an audience, um, as well as resources for how to, to try and identify the other 138 that we won't talk about today. So we can zoom out for a moment though, and just think about, well, why, why is this even a topic worth considering? Um, I think there are a handful of concrete examples that I'll touch on today. So I, I imagine that several of you may have squirmed in your seats at this photo, as I know I do every time, because some of these invasive plant species, for example, honeysuckle and Japanese barberry, which are two really common invasive shrubs in Wisconsin, have a documented, scientifically proven correlation with increased tick habitat, because they increase the amount of humidity within the shrub's leaf canopy, which is excellent tick habitat. And then they can climb out on the stems and reach out with their little legs and cling on to people. And so this is an issue because wood and deer ticks are associated with increased spread of a whole bunch of tick-borne diseases, namely Lyme's disease, but there are others. So that's a tangible human health impact from invasive plant species. Other invasive plant species like wild parsnip, um, which doubtless many of you are familiar with, have this horrible sap where if you break one of the stems when you brush up against a wild parsnip plant and get the sap on your skin, it causes this really horrible blistering rash. It leaves a scar for months or years and it's really unpleasant. So just another concrete example of a, a human health impact um, from a couple invasive plant species. What you'll gather is that these impacts, whether they're economic, human health, or otherwise, is that they are specific to each invasive plant species. Every species is different, has different impacts, but many of them cause one of these issues or another or all, all of them. So just something to keep in mind that no two invasive plants are the same. So then there can be economic impacts from some of these invasive plants. So I think this is a great photo in the lower right, the green shrubs in the left side of the photo and in the background are Japanese barberry shrubs. And so this is a woodland in Southwestern Wisconsin um, where I used a brush saw to remove all of the Japanese barberry shrubs in the lower right corner of the photograph. And what you can see is in the no Japanese barberry zone that there is a lot of bare soil. It's essentially a moonscape or a big patch of bare soil where nothing else was growing underneath that canopy of Japanese barberry. And so from a landowner's perspective, if you are hoping to say have timber harvests on your land and you have a really large infestation of Japanese barberry, you are not going to have very much or any tree seedling regeneration or timber stand regeneration. So if you were to harvest this woodland, that would be it. There would be no more trees in your woodlot and you would have to remove the Japanese barberry to encourage new trees to establish. It's a bit of a sidebar. You'll also note that there are no other woodland flowers or grasses growing in that bare area. And so this area is also providing really poor, low quality habitat for other mammal species, other insect species. And so it's also not a great ecological system going on here. It's, it's again, a bit of a moonscape. And so there are other environmental impacts that can come up with invasive plant species. Um, for example, garlic, mustard, and buckthorn have this trait much like black walnut trees that many of you might be familiar with where they secrete a natural herbicide through their root network that prevents the germination of nearby native plant species which is referred to as allelopathy and then this can contribute to creating a more dense um, population of the invasive plant species by preventing competition with other native plants in the area by preventing them from even growing in the first place 
Additionally, some of these invasive plants have an extended leaf out period, which we also refer to as extended phenology, which basically just means that the leaves pop out earlier in the spring and remain on the shrubs or plants later into the fall. And so they're able to effectively have an extended growing period that allows them to put on more new growth in a given growing season than their native plant competitors. And so I think this is well illustrated in the photo where we see a common buckthorn shrub in the foreground with all of its leaves still green, still healthy, the shrub is still growing. And then the background we can see a bunch of sugar maples that are already losing their leaves in the fall. And so this buckthorn is essentially out competing the native tree species in this woodland. And so all of these traits, the allelopathy, the extended phenology, the competitive growth nature can allow these plants to outcompete their native competitors and to create these dense monocultures that are to the exclusion or detriment of native plant species and create lower quality overall habitat for other plants and animals. So those are some of the environmental impacts. And so I think this photo will be familiar to many of you as well. There are some really well-known invasive plants that all of us can identify on site because they're so pervasive throughout the entire state. So wild parsnip, we've all seen roadsides, chock full of this plant in June and July when the yellow flowers are present. And the same can be said for teasel, super common in East Central Wisconsin. And then common buckthorn is basically in every woodland in the entire state. So some of these are really well known. And many of these invasive plants share common traits between one another. And so that's not to say that every invasive plant species will have all of these five traits, but most of them will have one, two, three, or four of them. And so I'll just run through them one by one because I think these are really key. And so to begin, many invasive plant species are adaptable to a wide range of environments. And what I mean by that is they can tolerate a wide range of growing conditions, such as northern or southern exposure, soil types, whether it's sandy, silty, or clayey, um, whether they're on a steep slope or a shallow slope. So they're, they're happy in a wide range of environments. They also tend to be pollinated by a wide range of insects. And so rather than having one or two specific bees or flies that are specific to that host plant, there might be 20 or 100 or 200 insects that can nectar on an invasive plant. And similarly, they tend to be able to disperse their seed into the environment by a wide range of mechanisms. And so that can be wind-borne seed uh, dispersion, that can be by birds, that can be uh, through human actions like mowing. And so they're able to disperse their seeds really effectively. And they tend to produce a ton of seeds, sometimes tens to hundreds of thousands per plant. Many invasive plants also have this interesting ability to not simply reproduce by growing seeds and having the seeds fall on the ground and grow a new plant from there, but also to spread vegetatively, which refers to the plant being able to clone itself by growing underground stem networks that connect each individual plant. And so this Canada thistle photograph, there are some more Canada thistle plants in the background that you can see. And it's very likely that these are all just one single plant that has these underground root networks or rhizomes that connect them all, making it all one plant that's really challenging to, to control or to kill on the landscape because it's all of these individual shoots that pop up, kind of like a mushroom colony almost. And finally, we've already touched on this, but many invasive plant species also have that allelopathic capability or the ability to secrete herbicides through their root network, natural herbicides that prevent the germination of other native plant species. And so from here, I'll zoom in just to a couple of really common invasive plants that you might have in your own yard or have seen in your neighbors or family's yards. And they're really pervasive throughout the entire state. We'll talk about how to identify and differentiate them and um, this is kind of a guide for how you might start to think about identifying these plants in the landscape. 
And so I'll just start out with a common one, uh, burning bush. And I'm going to try and pull up my laser pointer, which I always struggle to do, but I think should be visible now. And so burning bush has an opposite leaf arrangement, which is pretty distinctive. And what that refers to is that it has these matched pairs of leaves on the stem that then taper to a point at the tip and have a serrated leaf margin, which just refers to a sort of a saw-like or toothed or jagged leaf edge. And these leaves turn a really distinctive bright red in the fall uh, that you might start to see in the next few weeks. If you look into a woodland and see a bunch of shrubs that are really iridescent red, maybe a bit like a um, autumn blaze maple, and it's probably a colony of burning bushes. And another one of the characteristics that people really like about burning bush and why they plant it is it has these really distinctive corky wings, which are sort of these brittle, woody, thin structures on all of the mature stems that have this brownish red color um, and just have a really interesting texture. And it's, it is pretty neat, much like the fall interest, um, which is one of the reasons that people have, have planted it extensively. And it has these pinkish red fruits in the fall and the winter. So that's burning bush. Um, honeysuckle is another super common invasive plant that people tend to have in their landscapes. Instead of um, serrated leaf margins, this, this shrub has a smooth or entire leaf margin, but it also has this opposite leaf arrangement where they're in these matched pairs. The leaves also taper to a point. And so there are several species of honeysuckle in Wisconsin, several different shrub species, um, but they're all very similar for identification and management purposes. One of the main differences between them is their fruit color. So it can range from yellow to orange to red. It depends on which species you have, but they're all these little fleshy, juicy, little globes or orbs. And honeysuckle tends to also retain its leaves rather late into the growing season. So it has that extended phenology that we talk about. So I think this photo illustrates that pretty well, where there's snow on the ground, it's early winter, and honeysuckle is still retaining some of its leaves and still actively growing into the early winter. So here's a nice distribution map. I'll have a few of these that I'll, I'll touch on some more details in a bit, but this is all of the known confirmed presence points or locations where honeysuckle has been positively identified in Wisconsin in the last 15 years or so. And we can see that it's well distributed from north to south, east to west. Um, it's throughout the entire state. So odds are that it is in your area as well. And so now we can take a gander at Japanese barberry, a personal favorite of mine, because I dislike it so much, honestly. Um, this shrub is sold under a ton of different cultivars, which can make it super confusing. You'll probably be able to find it at your local nursery. This definitely still gets installed in new landscaping installations in my area. I live in Madison. There's a new housing development I bike by all the time. It has some beautiful new barberry hedges that are just installed. And these cultivars are often advertised um, for all kinds of traits, including sterile and non-sterile varieties, but they all tend to produce a whole lot of these oblong red fruit that are actually present now on these shrubs in the landscape. Um, and they also tend to have these really distinctive leaf clusters. So each one of these clusters is an individual leaf about an inch long to a half inch wide. And you'll see right behind the leaf clusters, these really distinctive and needle-like spines that cover all of the stems of the entire shrub. That if you walk through the shrub, the spines will break off and get embedded in your skin. And it's, it's truly awful in my opinion, um, but I've had to walk through a lot of this shrub in my, in my career. Uh, we find that it prefers sandier soils. Here's another image of the spines, but it really is also pretty widespread throughout the state from south to north. And I would guarantee that this big empty gap in the 
west central part of the state is due to a lack of reports and not due to a lack of barberry, just due to my travels in the La Crosse area, I would suspect this map is incomplete, but also pretty well distributed throughout the state. And now I'll shift gears just a little bit to touch on a few flowering plants and how to identify them that doubtless many of you have seen. So we'll start out with Dame's Rocket, which has these really distinctive flowers in the spring, typically around mid-May, give or take a couple of weeks. And people often mistake it for phlox. They see these big, dense, showy stands, Dame's Rocket, that are either purple or white flowers or both in the same population. But the way you can differentiate this from phlox is not only that phlox tends to flower later in, in June, at least in planted varieties, but the phlox has five petaled flowers and Dame's Rocket very clearly has four petals per flower. It also has these, because it's in the mustard family, these cool seed pods or siliques, if you wanna get fancy, that are long and narrow and look much like a garlic mustard seed pod or really any mustard seed pod. And so we can contrast these leaves with the honeysuckle and, um, burning bush because these have an alternate leaf arrangement on the stems. So that's a really key way to differentiate some of these species is if the leaves are in those matched opposite pairs or if they alternate one after the other as they climb the stem. We also see these, again, these serrated leaf margins tapering to a point. Um, so that's a pretty common leaf shape. And again, a distribution map, um, suspecting this one is not terribly complete but it is super common in South Central Wisconsin in the Madison area, but it is distributed throughout the state as well. It tends to prefer woodlands in my experience or shady woodland edges. Here we can talk about a couple of ground covers. Uh, here we have Bishop's Goutweed, which is certainly in my parents' yard and my aunt's yard. Uh, this is one that people I know tend to like to share with one another because it has this ability to establish and to spread vegetatively really easily, like we discussed earlier, and form these really good dense mats in shaded areas. So people like it as a ground cover. It tends to have these really distinctive clefted leaves where there's sort of a gap in each leaf, even though this is all one entire leaf, there's this notch. It has a serrated leaf margin. And because this plant is in the carrot family, it has these distinctive white umbels, which is a fancy name for how the flower is shaped, which is sort of this flat topped cluster. So wild parsnip has umbels, wild carrot slash Queen Anne's lace has umbels because they're all in the carrot family. So that's a really distinctive characteristic. And here we see a non-variegated Bishop Scout weed where the leaves are all green instead of green and white. And according to my distribution map, it's mostly in the northern part of the state, but I'm a bit skeptical because I've just seen it in so many people's gardens that in Columbia and Dane counties that I suspect that this just doesn't get a whole lot of reporting in um, a reporting app that I will touch on in a couple of minutes. Creeping bellflower is an interesting plant. Uh, mainly because it spreads vegetatively. So again, via those underground rhizomes, but it also can spread by seed. Whereas I don't believe that Bishop Scoutweed does produce viable seed. Creeping bellflower is distinctive, um, not really because of its leaves. Its leaves again are, have the serrated margin tapering to a point. They have an alternate arrangement on the stem as opposed to an opposite arrangement. So they look a bit like the, um, Dame's rocket leaves we touched on earlier, but the flowers are totally different, very distinctive. I realized as I was thinking about it, they look a bit like hosta flowers in that they're purple, they're bell-shaped, they start out closed like in this background flower and then they open up and they have five parts. So creeping refers to how this plant spreads, which is vegetatively, and bell flower obviously refers to the flower shape Again, another likely underreported plant species, but there are populations in northern and southern part of the state, which would suggest it tolerates cold and warmer climates. But now I'll just zoom out for a moment to say, well, okay, so those were seven, seven common invasive, maybe it was just six common invasive plant species used in landscaping in Wisconsin, but 
what if I encounter a plant species that I'm not sure if it's native or it's invasive or, or what it even is? What, what can I do about that? What are some resources that I can use to help me? So it's a great question without a super simple answer, but suffice it to say, there are tons of resources out there for you. And it really just depends on what you prefer and what, what works best for your own preference. So I have used all of these methods over the years and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. So there are a ton of good books, obviously out there, field guides that you can put in your backpack and take along with you on, on a walk or a, a tour of someone's garden. And so they all have disadvantages and advantages. So Wildflowers of Wisconsin is excellent for identifying native flowers in Wisconsin, as the name implies, but it's not so good for identifying native shrubs or invasive shrubs or flowers. Weeds of the Northern US and of the Northeast have good info on invasive plants and agricultural weeds, but don't touch on some of those natives. The Wisconsin DNR publishes a nice little two by four inch, it's essentially a deck of, of laminated note cards that covers many of the most common invasive plant species that are regulated in Wisconsin. It's a really cheap or maybe even free field guide. I think it's a couple bucks a piece. If you click on this link or any of these links, when I share this presentation with Melanie and Tom, you can go to the website and check them out. Then of course, there are a whole bunch of websites and smartphone apps that you can use. So I obviously have to mention my own lab's website. Um, we've got a really good series of fact sheets on invasive plant identification as well as management that you can peruse and are really good science-based, field-tested, um, data-driven documents that I really do recommend highly. I think they're quite excellent. We also have a new invasive plant identification resource where we basically have created a, a small curriculum where it's meant to teach you essentially all of the terrestrial invasive plant species in Wisconsin, which is to say ones that grow on land rather than in lakes and streams and rivers. And so it has a bunch of good tables and photographs and a, a, a test that we're developing. So that's a good resource that you can check out. Then there are a couple of smartphone apps where you download these free apps, and I'm sure many of you have used them, where effectively you you take your phone, you point it at a plant and take a picture and the app will try and guess what it is. Um, these can be great if you have a plant with a flower present. I've had great success, kind of eerily good success with some of these apps when I've been stumped in the field, but you need an internet connection. And if you're taking a picture of a plant that's dormant, say in the winter or just of a leaf or just of some bark, these apps are really going to struggle and not come up with a whole lot of good ideas. And then there are a couple really good database websites where if you think you know the species, if you have some confidence, you can type it in to Minnesota or Illinois wildflowers. And the descriptions in these websites are super thorough. The photos are excellent. And I really can't recommend them highly enough. And finally, there are the people. So there's the staff at the Renz lab, like myself, my boss, Dr. Renz, to shoot us an email with a question, and we're always happy to answer it. The same goes for your local Wisconsin DNR staff, your foresters in your county, at the Endangered Resources Bureau, same thing. Send them an email, they're always happy to help. And the same can be said of Extension, UW Extension County agents. Um, if you have a local cooperative weed management area, those folks deal with this sort of issue every day. So we are here to help. Don't hesitate to reach out if, if you're totally stumped, we're, we're there for you. And then when it comes to uh, steps that you can take in your own yard, you have a lot of choices. And so when it comes to making new installations, I'll just harp on picking native species whenever possible. There's a cool app called the Landscape Alternatives app, also free, where you can say, type in a shrub that is non-native that you might like a replacement for, like burning bush that has fall interest and cool bark. And then this app will suggest an alternative that has similar characteristics, but is a native shrub. You can search for local native plant nurseries. The DNR has a nice database, it's linked here. And the same can be said for native revegetation contractors who will 
try to use native plant stock whenever possible when they're making their installations on your property. You can also try and avoid sharing or spreading aggressive plant species, especially if they are unknown, whether they're native or invasive. And also when you're say pulling garlic mustard on your property and trying to dispose of it, it's best to dispose of these things properly to put them in the garbage bag and landfill them because that is the safest way to prevent them from spreading on someone else's property or from dropping seed after you heap them up in your compost pile. And finally, to avoid mowing invasive plant species when they have those seeds present. So for example, with garlic mustard, when those long seed pods are present in late spring, don't take the brush mower to them because it's very possible those seeds are ripe and they'll just scatter them around. And finally, it can come down to controlling invasive plant species on your property or your neighbor's properties. And so again, there are those fact sheets that I mentioned that my lab has produced. There are lots of resources out there beyond my lab, but suffice to say there are both mechanical and chemical options that are safe and effective. Happy to touch on any and all of those if people have specific questions about specific plant species. And then, just give me a moment, I've clicked the wrong button. There we go. And then beyond your own property, there are a number of steps you can take as well. So you can report invasive plant species as you locate them on the landscape. So those maps that I showed in previous slides, the state of Wisconsin and all of those little dots of all the known populations of each species, that's through that map was created through a smartphone reporting app called GLEDIN, which is an acronym for the Great Lakes Early Detection Network, where basically you, again, take your phone, take a picture of an invasive plant that you have located, and you type in a little bit of information about where you found it and submit it to my colleague, Anne, who will then verify the photo, verify that it is what you think it is, or if not, she'll send it back to you for some more information. And then that that data point gets entered into a database where researchers and extension folks like myself can use that information to, to create materials and to better inform management decisions statewide. So that can be a cool way to get involved. It can treat finding invasive plants like a scavenger hunt and report them on your phone. And obviously you can volunteer as well in your local parks. I guarantee that any of the land managers in your area for any of the park systems. They have volunteer garlic mustard poles or buckthorn cut down days. And basically as you start to look around and notice these plants, they are everywhere. And, and many of our natural areas are more or less drowning in invasive plant species. So, so people are always looking for, for help and are always eternally grateful for whatever they get. So it can be a really good way to connect with other interested folks in your area and to get involved and to connect with your park systems. And you can even support local and statewide level organizations such as those cooperative weed management areas. There are, are a handful throughout the state that tend to coordinate resources on this issue. And there's also the Invasive Plant Association of Wisconsin that helps draft policy and make recommendations for the the DNR and the state as a whole. So lots of levels to get involved at, both at, at your own property scale and to zoom out to, to higher and higher levels. So there's a lot of work out there to be done. So anything that folks wanna contribute is always very welcome. So with that, uh, I'm at a half an hour. So I can take questions. Again, I'm Leo from the, the Rens Lab and subbing in for Anne with the Wifton network. But I think with that, I can end the show and take any questions people may have. So thanks for having me, y'all. Thank you so much, Leo. That was wonderful. Um, so much good information. So I'm kind of new to all of this invasive um, species information. So can you just tell me a little bit about if there's any regulations on bringing invasive species in? You had talked about some of these things still being available for purchase at nurseries. And why, why is that still available if they're invasive? Oh, that's an excellent question, Melanie. So with regards to whether there's regulation or not, there, there is regulation at the state level through that NR40 rule that I'd highlighted earlier. And if anyone wants more information, you can go to the dnr.wi.gov and type in NR40, just the letters NR and the number 40. 
and you'll get to this whole landing page. But to summarize it really quickly, there are about 140 species that are regulated statewide. And what the regulation entails is it manages whether and how these plants can be sold, transported, and whether they need to be managed. So what that means is there are different levels of regulation, but certain species under no, no circumstances are legally allowed to be sold or transported in the state of Wisconsin or, or imported or exported. That's kind of the higher tier of regulation. That's a smaller list of plants. This rule also applies to animals and bacteria and mollusks. It's a, it's a whole rule, but I'll just focus in on the plants because that's what I know best. And then there's this other tier of regulation that's a little less stringent where the plants are under some circumstances allowed to be transported or sold. And so Japanese barberry is a great example of this sort of confusing split nature of this regulation where certain cultivars of Japanese barberry that the DNR has decided are less invasive, i.e. they produce less seeds or less likely to be transported and spread into natural areas and cause human or economic harm, those are still, they essentially have a carve out or an exemption where they are still allowed to be sold in nurseries and installed by landscapers. And there's also this interplay where the horticultural industry does get input into this rulemaking process where these, this list gets revised every five years and it's undergoing revision right now. And Japanese barberry is pretty economically important because it has historically been sold Throughout the state, it generates a lot of revenue. And so there would be a lot of pushback if certain species were totally banned from being able to be sold or transported. So that's why there are all these different carve outs and different levels of, of restriction. And the idea is it's a compromise between industry and regulators such that some harm is avoided, but people are still able to make a living, so. It's roughly how it works. There's a lot more to it, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, there's another question that kind of touches on that same um, that same thread. What is the goal of in space, invasive species management? It seems like an uphill battle. Right. So there are a lot of different approaches to this, and so it the the not very helpful answer is it somewhat comes down to what the land owner's goals are, and those goals may vary according to the landowner. And so, in other words, there is no one objective that everyone is going for here. And so I think the, the question is well put because some of these plants are so common and pervasive that the goal is may seem at face value to be, well, we should just get rid of all of these plants because they're all bad and they all cause harm. So we should just eradicate them. It seems like the simplest answer, but then as you think about that, you're like, oh, well, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these plants throughout the state and the amount of time and effort required is prohibitive. So that's not a realistic goal. And so what most people end up deciding is some sort of type of triaging where they're like, okay, I have these 10, essentially what people do is they inventory what invasive plant species they have on their property, how much time and how much money they have, and then they triage what, what is the best return on investment, what, what management can I conduct that is the least expensive and has the best return on my investment. So that's typically what people's goal is, is to do the easiest thing that's the cheapest that has a good return. So not a super specific answer, but it varies from property to property. There are hundreds of these regulated species. They're all a little different. Everyone has different capacity, whether you're a homeowner or a contractor or a county government or a parks department, you'll have different machinery, different expertise, different resources at your disposal. So it, it's all over the place, simply put, um, and there's no clear cut answer, but there are some shared goals, and usually it's just to minimize harm, however, however you see best to do that. That's a whole other lecture, basically, is how to prioritize those things. Okay, thank you. 
We also have um, a few questions on some specific plants that people are um, curious about whether they're invasive or not and how to get rid of them. So mm -hmm. um, one question is, um, uh, there's a couple of questions about Bishop Scout weed. Is snow on the mountain another name for Bishop Scout weed? I think that it may be, and I can give that a search right now. Um, it certainly is ringing a bell as a plant that is a, an aggressive ground cover but I can't remember off the top of my head if it is, but the issue is with these um, invasive plant species, they often have so many different common names that vary from place to place that regulators also struggle to, to even list them properly, especially when you get into different cultivars, say of Japanese barberry, it, it can be a bit confusing. So the short answer is I don't remember offhand, but I suspect that it may be. Yeah, I feel like it looks exactly the same, but I can't remember if um, it actually flowers like the Bishop's Goutweed does. Right, because Bishop's Goutweed has a super distinctive white carrot flowers. And so I'm also thinking of there are some other rapidly spreading ground covers that are under consideration for regulation. So I think I had a picture of Vinca slash Periwinkle, which is not currently regulated, but every five years they think about, oh, should we put this on the list or not? I think the same is true of Silver Archangel, which is also called something else. So it, it's a constantly evolving regulatory landscape that is frankly too complicated for most regular homeowners to keep up with, which is why I'm happy to give talks like this because it, it does get a bit muddled. Awesome, so then piggybacking off of that, um, there's a couple of questions about how to get rid of Bishop Scout weed. Right. So Typically, um, it depends on what, your, what you are comfortable with and what equipment you have. And so the simplest answer is if you have a small population, say growing in the corner of a bed and it's 10 square feet, the simplest answer is always just me mechanically slash manually remove it, dig it out or mow it. And so when it comes to digging it out, particularly with these plants that spread vegetatively via those underground roots. What's key is to dig out all of the roots. It may seem easy to say and intuitive, but each of those little root fragments, if you leave them behind in the soil, can actually re-germinate the, the next year and form a whole new colony of, of bishop scout weed or whatever the vegetatively spreading plant is. So it pays to be thorough when hand digging and to remove more soil than you think you need. So you make sure you get the entire perimeter of the colony. If you're mowing, um, the general rule of thumb for controlling invasive plants with mowing is to do it at a time that is going to harm the plant as much as possible without mowing such that you're going to spread the plant accidentally. And so with Bishop's gout weed and many of these invasive plants, they're most vulnerable when they have just um, essentially initiated flowering. And so not when they're just the green carpet of leaves in the spring, but once they've sent up those flowering stalks and they're just, the flowers are just starting to mature. If you mow the plants, then they've put a ton of energy into growing those flowers. And so if you, if you, cut them down to the soil surface at that time, it's really going to deplete those roots energy reserves. And that's true of Canada thistle. That's true of many of, of um, creeping bell flower, where you want to mow them when they're flowering. But the big caveat here, I really want to stress this, is you don't want to do any sort of mowing when you believe that there are going to be ripe seeds present. And so you don't want to wait too long after flowering has begun because eventually seeds are going to form. And by mowing them, this is probably intuitive, you're essentially going to blow them all over the place and spread the population. So that's the big caveat is you don't want to wait too long. But with typically, we estimate three to five years is a general rule of mowing at that proper timing that's really going to hurt the plant, you will reduce or eliminate a given population of an invasive plant. But the key is to do it at that correct timing, which varies from species to species and year to year, which can make it tough. Using, we'll also, go ahead, Tom. I assume that using a weed whacker would uh, be mm -hmm. considered mowing. 
yeah, yeah, you could use a string trimmer, you could use a lawn mower. Um, it would be helpful to set the deck height as low as possible to remove as much of that above ground plant material as possible. Um, you could use a brush saw if it's a, a more coarse plant or a more mature plant, like one of the ones with the, the spinning circular blade. Um, and then I would be remiss to not mention you, you certainly can use herbicides as well. And so that's something that you would want to check the label to make sure that you are following all of the label directions, wearing all of the personal protective equipment, not spraying herbicides near water and using the approved amounts and rates because the label is the law. And I'm happy to talk about that as much or as little as people want, but there are certainly safe and effective chemical options for managing gout weed as well. So it's I would think whatever your preference is. Something like a lawn dandelion killer would be something that you could consider if you wanted to take the care. Yeah, exactly. So something, um, a, a lawn weed dandelion slash creeping Charlie clover could be a good fit because then it won't harm any established turf grasses that are in the vicinity and it will uh, target broadleaf slash flowering plant species specifically. So that can be a good option as opposed to say Roundup or glyphosate, which is a broad spectrum herbicide, meaning it will kill any plant that it touches, which may not be desirable, particularly if you have gout weed growing um, adjacent to, to a turf area. We have a couple more things. Um, um, one of our attendees did say that her flower, um, snow on the mountain does flower as well. So, and she okay. did, was the same. Um, okay. So it could be another common name for Bishop Scoutweed. And I was trying to look it up as I'm speaking. So that, that seems plausible to me. And then what is the best way to handle that plant debris after mowing or weed whacking? Should that be removed? Right. So to be, to be more specific about handling plant debris after removal, really the question is whether or not it is going to be able to, um, to vegetatively or, or to spread if you do not garbage bag and landfill that plant material. And so it will vary species by species. And so for an example with um, Bishop Scoutweed, because it has that ability to spread via stem and root fragments, my recommendation would be to either to landfill it in a garbage bag or to have a compost heap that is something you're monitoring and is perhaps not deep in the woods that you're, you're not really sure what's going on there, but is maybe surrounded by turf or maybe on a concrete pad or something such that it can rot without establishing um, via those root fragments. Whereas with something like um, say garlic mustard, where if you hand pull it and there are no flowers or seeds present, you can probably just open compost it because those seeds are not going to ripen and mature and fall if the plant has been uprooted properly and just left to rot. But if there are seed pods present, you should certainly bag it and landfill it. So I would say if in doubt, if you're not sure if it's going to spread or just throw it away, rake it up and throw it away or compost it in a, in a sort of a secure site. And if you are confident it's not going to spread, you could dispose of it like any other yard waste. Thank you. And then is there any other technique or anything that we should do differently if these kinds of species are around our trees for removal? That's a great question. So I would say any sort of manual removal method is, is always going to be a good choice if you're around trees and you're concerned about harming the trees. Um, you'd really have to, to harm a tree with mechanical removal. You'd have to like damage the roots with a, with a spade, which would be really challenging. Um, with chemical removal methods, i.e. herbicides, there are some herbicides um, that are unlikely to be used at sort of a homeowner level, but can have some injury to trees and shrubs in the vicinity if the herbicide falls within the, um, the canopy slash drip line of a tree. And so those might be herbicides like method is kind of a a famous one. And so just make sure that if you're using herbicides in the drip line of a tree that you read the label and see if it has any sort of 
warnings or cautions about potential injury resulting uh, if used in the vicinity of a desirable tree. And so most lawn sort of dandelion killers are not going to have those sorts of cautions or restrictions, but it, it pays to read those labels because they're, they contain a lot of good information um, so that you don't make a sad error and, and damage a desirable tree. I've, I've seen it done and it's, it's never a, a happy sight, so. One of a couple techniques that I'm aware of uh, when you want to, when you're using herbicides, nobody likes to use them, uh, is to take a, a milk jug, cut off the bottom, put it over the plant and then spray inside the, the spout. Mm. So then you're, you're reducing the spread, you're using minimal amount and it's restricted to that in the individual plant. Another thing that I've used is, this is gonna sound kind of weird, uh, is I take uh, Roundup Concentrate, put it in a baby bottle. And if you've got something like Canada thistle or buckthorn, cut the plant off, put a few drops of the herbicide out of the baby bottle right on that cut area. So you're severely limiting the, uh, the amount of herbicide that you're introducing to the environment. Some people will even use a chemical resistant farm rubber glove, a heavy duty rubber glove and put a cotton glove over the top and yeah. they'll coat the cotton glove in the herbicide solution and will essentially wipe the plant with their hand. So a lot of options for reducing overspray and drift if you're concerned about. Ryan Huddleston calls that the glove of death. Yep, glove of death. That's one the one. Used, uh, uh, in addition to that is the, if anybody still gets a newspaper like I do, it comes in a plastic bag. What are those couple of those plastic bags on and a paper towel. And when you're done, you pull the bag over. Throw the whole thing away and throw the whole thing away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of good options for being very selective, particularly if you have sensitive, desirable vegetation nearby, which in our landscaping is often the case. Awesome, well, thank you so much. I, there's one last question by Tom, actually. So Tom, I will let you ask your last question. And I think then this is um, where we're, um, we've, oh, we've almost got everybody. We have actually, one. Actually, you I already have, answered my question, so. Okay. Oh, good. I have creeping Charlie all over my raspberries. What can I use to kill it, but not harm the raspberries? You touched on that a little bit. Is that, is that possible? Yeah, it can be really challenging because creeping Charlie and raspberries are both broadleaf plant species. So though that's really going to preclude the use of herbicides. If you're very, if you're, if no injury is acceptable to the raspberries, then that's going to preclude the use of really any herbicide. If you're willing to tolerate some amount of injury, uh, one of the things I recall about Creeping Charlie is that it tends to green up really early in the spring, perhaps in late March to early April. And raspberries tend to be a bit later, perhaps early May is sort of my offhand recollection. And so I will make the note that if you were to apply a weak solution of Roundup or glyphosate or even 2,4-D slash dandelion killer in the early spring when the when the creeping charlie is green and actively growing but the raspberries are dormant that that would be one way to not harm the raspberries but to manage the creeping charlie your other options you've probably already guessed are hand pulling but because creeping charlie is one of those vegetative spreaders you can rip out the creeping charlie year after year and if you leave root fragments behind it'll just re-sprout and so it's it's a pain in the butt. So those are kind of the, the ways to not hurt the raspberries and manage the creeping Charlies. There's no, no easy solution there. Awesome, thank you so much. We had um, one last question about where to find this recording. We will have this on our YouTube channel. I did put the link in there, but if you go to YouTube and type in Appleton Public Library, you'll find all of the Master Gardener's recordings and you can watch them and share them as you'd like. We have some great information um, on those, those programs just like today. So thank you so much, Leo. Um, Tom, I'll let you wrap us up and say goodbye. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Leo. 
Uh, if you have any questions, you can send them to uh, Gardner SOS at outagami.org. Um, we do handle questions about lead identification. So any of the uh, resources that Leo mentioned, uh, you can also send them to myself at that uh, address. And uh, it's been a great year for us and thank you all for your support. Thank you all for coming today and thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us, Leo. This was amazing. Yep. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Tom. And thanks to everyone for attending. Have a great day.